Good morning and welcome. We're doing something a, a little different today during the message. We're joined this morning by Chris, who's over here with her own her own camera. Andrew's over here with his. And we're just going to have a, a conversation about what's happening, and Andrew's going to edit this all together in, in a wonderful way. All of us are journeying right now through this pandemic. We're searching for answers. We're casting our nets on the side of the boat, and we feel like it's coming up empty. We're feeling a myriad of feelings. and We're not really having the time to process those feelings, to talk about the fear and the trauma, the concerns and the distance between loved ones. We also don't get a chance to talk about what the pandemic is revealing to us about ourselves and our, our, our community. And so I thought I'd bring Chris and Andrew into this conversation today. And we have no idea how this is going to go, but that's the best thing. It's just to see where the Spirit leads us. So one of the things we've been asking each other is how, what, how in this pandemic time, what is, what is this time revealing to you? Um, I guess I'll go first, then, then Andrew. Um, it's revealed a few things to me, but uh, one in particular has been um, the importance of connection to people. And life in the country, which may be specific to the county, I don't know, versus life in the city. And I haven't had a lot of opportunity to spend time in the city, but when I have, and I've been walking around, it's give as wide a berth as you can to people, and maybe a smile and maybe a nod, but most likely not. And here, it feels so different because it seems that people here have more time to stop. People aren't rushing off to do things. And it's been wonderful to encounter people on walks and in the stores and just small conversations can really make a difference to um, how, how you feel about, about life on a given day. So I don't know whether it's me being more aware, uh, which could be, maybe nothing's changed, but me certainly being more aware and valuing those opportunities. Um, and that's made a difference in day-to-day -day life, is those small connections, and sometimes they're longer conversations. The other day, my husband walked back from Clark's after taking a car in normally a half hour walk, it took him an hour and a half to get home because of the people that he met uh, on the way. And I thought that was just so indicative of, of how some days uh, turn out. And that's, that's been a, an important revelation to me. Mm -hmm. So that openness, that awareness. The awareness and other people that I think are also anxious for mm -hmm. a conversation. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it goes both ways. I, uh, I agree. Connection is, is really that feeling of, of belonging, and that's been really um, un, under attack during this pandemic. So, the, you know, because we've had to spend more time isolated, you know, staying at home. Um, so I, I, found, I, I was surprised to find myself really reacting to that because I'm actually quite an introvert person and I spend a lot of my time anyway by myself reading or composing or playing the piano um, I do a lot of solitary things and I thought you know this uh, I'm gonna ride this pandemic out like nothing like uh, some of my more extroverted friends are going to be are really suffer but I'll be fine but the fact is I haven't always been fine I've really really felt um, disconnected and uh, lonely and uh, those sorts of things and those little moments that you mentioned Chris are so important like I really going grocery shopping has been like the highlight of my week I just love it I love Foodland I love everyone there um, they're lovely it's so nice to just be chatting with them and <laughs> You know, t the cashiers have been my best friends during this pandemic, right? Jeremiah, I feel like we are in this, this time of exile from one another. And I'm overwhelmed actually in this moment because Chris and Andrew and I can sit together and do this. We, we're allowed to do this. And yet there are families out there who are not allowed to get together. There's a moment the other day I thought, you know, what I'll do is I'll invite a family of nine people because we're going to have 10 in church. So bring your family members of nine, all come to church, sit safely, and just 
talk to each other. I'll open the doors and you can just talk to each other. And we'll call it a religious service. And that's, Andrew's really hit it. It's that disconnection, how at, at risk we are as a community of sort of just disenfranchising ourselves and disconnecting. So the beauty of, of living here in a village is that it's, it's so much easier to keep those connections going. The post office, the grocery store, you know, the pharmacy, the hardware store. You, now that you have to line up at the hardware store to wait, get your stuff, you can actually talk to some people a little bit more. I think our level of fear is going down, and, and we're, but we're anxious now. We want, we want to come back to that normal, and I'm hopeful we're going to. But I'm, I'm even more amazed that we have this opportunity now to, to create something even better. And for me, the pandemic has revealed a lot of the things that are broken. And we have an opportunity now to, to repair and, and bring the beauty of creation out for everyone. The second question you wanted to talk about <laughs> um, was uh, how has the pandemic changed how we approach liturgy and what we respectively do? Um, on a on a Sunday, which is now on a on a Friday, getting ready for a Sunday, um, and um, for me, there's I guess two answers to that question. One is the more corporate liturgy, which is for me offering the prayers of, of the people. And while I think most weeks or every week I offer some kind of prayer for for COVID, either more of a global prayer, uh, which was this week, or um, something specific to what's happening, and and obviously recognizing how people are feeling. Um, but I also feel it's really important that while COVID has changed our lives, I don't want it to rule my life anyhow, because I think there's a lot of other things that need to be prayed for. And we can become so focused on, 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 on COVID, I just think we need to pray beyond that. Um, and so from a corporate perspective, I've tried to integrate into, into the prayers things beyond um, what COVID is doing to our lives. Um, and then personally, I have, uh, and, and tying back into the, the need for connection, um, before I, I go to sleep at night, I go through my day and I name all the people that I've had a meaningful connection with. And that can be by phone, it can be something short, it can be a longer uh, connection. Um, but my goal is five. My goal is, is five, and most days I hit five. Um, some days it's a lot more, um, and, and some days it's less. And then I try and name two things that were really good in the day, because there's always something good in the day, even a bad day, there's something good. And then I choose one person to pray particularly for. Um, so, and that has been a year. I haven't done that previously to the COVID days, but that's how it's changed my prayer life personally. I'm thinking of, of uh, the Pope uses this prayer as well. It's the five-fingered prayer. So uh, those who are closest to us, right, the thumb, those who are pointing us in a direction, our teachers, uh, those who are reaching for, and, and you move through your hand and go through these, these prayers, and, and the, the weakest finger is, is our index finger, right? And then we are for another index, our fourth finger, and then the small fingers, we, we pray for those who are, are forgotten and are, are not there. Yeah, it's really, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's exactly, it's amazing because what, what I heard again is, is that word awareness, right? That the pandemic is making us more and more aware and it's, 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 it's shaping our prayer life. It's, it's shaping our liturgies. Uh, it's hard not to preach on it. It's hard not to bring it into, um, into what we're talking about. But I think we have to be, as you said, be very, very careful that it doesn't become the only message, right? Or the only medium. But there's so much else we have to be aware of, be aware of, because there are other issues that are going on. Life is continuing, death is continuing, and life out of death is continuing as well. And we, we need to be constantly attuned to those things, or we'll miss them, and and they will become the forgotten, right? In this, and that's, so it's yes, we're all in this together, but we're all not in it the same way, and we have to be mindful of that. And as Andrew said, uh, even our congregation members out there, hopefully we're all reaching to each other as much as we can and to this community that we call home. Yeah. It's shaped a lot of what I'm doing, but it's, I'm trying to make it not overwhelm uh, the message, that it does not become the medium. Well, uh, if, uh, as far as liturgy and the, the music portion of the service goes, 
Um, it's been a it's been a challenge because uh, uh, suddenly I'm a soloist. Um, you know, I don't have the choir, so it's. So, uh, I think the one of the, the there's two things that people need in their life to to have to have joy and satisfaction, and one of them is connection, but the other one is meaning. You 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 know it, to feel like your life has meaning. And one of the things I think church does is it helps us to discover the meaning in things, even sadness, even in grief, even in, um, you know, we're, we're constantly um, talking in, in church about what's important, what values are important. Um, and the songs that we sing um, uh, give emotional weight to all of to all of that stuff but I don't have the, I don't have the, the the singers so the lyrics are are missed and I'm doing you know instrumental versions of all of the hymns the tunes are nice but they don't but we miss out on some of the meaning so that's why I've been experimenting with different techniques uh, to you know to play along with other singers or to um, edit in um, other people doing doing justice to the lyrics so that it's um, so that we get some of that meaning making that is so um, important in the songs so uh, that's how it's affected it's affected me in a very good way in that I've had to get really creative mm -hmm. yeah it's an opportunity it's, it's, it's reflecting on that how you lay a foundation but the choir gives voice to it. so you, you create this opportunity, you open this opportunity for experience, but it's then the voices that, that sort of project that out into the congregation, yeah. into the world. Yeah. yeah. That's really cool. They carry, they carry the meaning of, uh, of, um, of the music with, with, with the lyrics, mm -hmm. you know, and how, and how you sing them. And they, I mean, when I, it was such a great pleasure to work for years with Lori and, um, watch her work with the choir, you know, around enunciation, but also around, you know, which words to make louder and which, which to make softer and how to pronounce things so that the lyrics would carry all the way to the back row. And, you know, we paid as much attention to what we, what we were saying uh, than, than the notes. Um, and it, you know, it was such a pleasure and uh, so I've had over a year now of not working with Laurie or the choir, and I, I really, really miss them. I miss you all. I miss them so much. When, oh, t t if you remember, when, when we were setting up for this conversation, I went, we went to grab the chairs, and on this particular chair, there was a, there was a long blonde hair. And I thought, too. I thought, oh, I miss Donna. <laughs> I think this is, I think this might be one of Donna's hairs. I, I miss her so much. Well, so. this Marg's well, backrest back there Mark's and the pews. Oh, I just, and I, I, every Sunday morning I come in, I, I look out and, and there's, I see everybody. I just, you know, I see them all out there. We will be back. There will be that moment. But for now, we're, we're, we're holding on. We're shaping. And that's, the seg and that's the segue to the third question, <laughs> which is what are things going to look like in the future? And then how do we get back yeah. on track? I, I was wrestling with that question. And I think but the only answer I have is I don't know. I, I don't know what it's going to look like. I know that there's going to be more of this. There's probably going to be some of this. We're going to have to talk about that in the future. Um, we're still in that waiting time, right, of what's going to be revealed to us by government officials and medical officers of health. Um, but I, my heart tells me once it's okay, we'll be here, and, and we will rejoice again. Yeah, don't know. The, um, in terms of getting things back on track, of course, the question is when. But I remember in another congregation uh, talking to someone at Presbytery for some advice on things that were unraveling. And they suggested that what can often be helpful to a congregation is coming up with um, a galvanizing outreach experience. Uh, no, galvanizing outreach project. Right. And, um, you know, that could be outreach, it could be fundraising or something, but some, 
a project that could bring people together. Um, what that would look like, I have no idea. Um, and outreach is always something that appeals to people. It's, it's interesting. I wonder if we planted that, and it's a bit strange metaphor, we planted that seed at the last board meeting yeah, I wondered about with, 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 the, the daffodils. with the daffodils and, and planting hope when we did uh, in a great discussion, as it is, we're planting yellow flowers, and in the next uh, week or so, if it warms up, we're hoping to plant a whole lot of flowers. And, and looking at the memorial gardens and creating spaces of hope in those memorial gardens for people, just to, to sit and to feel that, that hope that Jeremiah talked about, even in the time of exile, the time of destruction, there's always this glimmer of hope, this light that shines. So, we might have we might have actually done that. Started it, Started it anyway. Yeah. In in preparing for this question in particular, um, I I was I tried to dig up this quote from the playwright Chekhov, and I couldn't find it anywhere. So I might be misremembering or putting words into his mouth, but it was something along the lines of, um, people are really good in crises. They're really good in catastrophes. It's ordinary life that's the real challenge. You know, the day in, day out, it's trying to be a good person, you know, dur during not emergencies. And I thought this, this pandemic has been kind of, it's a crisis, but it hasn't been a, a galvanizing crisis. It hasn't been something that we've come together to manage. It's been and it's been unending, it's been so long. So it's been a slog more than anything, a slog and an inability to connect around doing something. So I agree, Chris, I think when, when we're back together, having a project, having something to accomplish will maybe bring up the energy that we've all been not giving a chance to blossom over the past year so to you know to get back to doing something I think I agree with Steve I think we will get back to it I think people really miss it they miss uh, they miss the coffee time, the coffee time. and the yeah. snacks yeah. as much as the service I mean because I know because we don't get as many people watching our our little Facebook videos as we used to get downstairs having coffee and and, and um, muffins, so, so yeah, I think that, that, that what we do here is an opportunity for people to find meaning and to connect, and that's still very much needed. Yeah, I'm, I'm really missing communion. I'm just really, and we're trying to find some ways to do that uh, into the future, but it's gonna be tricky. But we, we will navigate through. I, I know that we will, we will adjust. You're right, I was talking to a World War II vet the other day, and he said, you know, the, the interesting thing about this pandemic is um, I knew the war was going to end. This one, I'm not sure, right? I just, I don't see the end in sight kind of thing. But it, it will come. We see it coming in different places. And so we start redeveloping, reorganizing, and reimagining. And that's what I'm really hoping people will do, either in outreach projects or or a choir or other things, is that we reimagine what it is to be the church here in Wellington, what it man what it reimagine what it means to be to be Christ among all people. That's what I'm hoping for. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yes. It's fun. And thank you to everyone out there. So share your thoughts, share your ideas, and uh, let us know. All right, we'll see you soon. <laughs>